Hello, welcome to this short course on causal inference using observational data in R. I'm Liam Bison McGrath, lecturer in politics and director of the Peck Lab at Royal Holloway University in London. Today, we're going to go over different approaches and different tools to be able to make causal inferences when evaluating programs or more generally trying to identify the effect of policies with the use of observational data. Our session today is gonna to consist of three main parts. First, I'm gonna provide a general overview of the logic of causal inference, what it means to make a causal statement using the potential outcomes framework. Second, given this approach, what are some problematic comparisons that we often may make in terms of trying to identify the effect of a program or a policy that actually may be invalid due to the logic of causal inference? Third, given these problems, given these challenges, how can we use observational data to actually have more robust causal inferences? Throughout, I'm gonna illustrate these issues and these solutions using R, a common open source statistical language that is excellent for these type of tools. A lot of the examples and a lot of the data that I'm gonna be working with here is based upon this free textbook from the World Bank on impact evaluation in practice. This is an excellent introduction to the tools and the issues we're discussing here, but also with further extensions. In this regard, I've also set up a website that codes all of the examples and analyses from this book in R. So you're able to use that rather than propriety software such as Stata. So let's start. Let's first think about the issue of causal inference. What is causality? and What are some of the challenges we face if we wanna make causal statements about the impacts of policies and programs? Before we get started, I wanna introduce a little bit of notation just so that we're able to simplify some of the exposition throughout. And this is just gonna be consisting of two key things for now. First, whether you receive the program or whether you receive the policy or whether you receive the treatment. This is gonna be indicated by a T with the subscript I saying that this is the status for this particular unit. In our case, this variable can only take on two values, one or zero. It takes on a value of one if you receive the program takes on a value of zero if you did not receive the program. So we're focusing on binary treatments here. And then secondly, the thing we're interested in, the outcome for a unit, what we want to see in terms of whether the program actually has an impact. And so in this respect, we're indicating this by Y. It's our outcome, it's our dependent variable, the subscript I again indicating that this is the outcome for a particular unit. So what do we think of as causality? Within the potential outcomes counterfactual framework, the key idea is, is to think about what would the outcome have been for a programming participant in the absence of the program. Then you compare this to that outcome from actually participating within the program. And so if we know what the difference is between that outcome and what the counterfactual would have been from them not participating in the program, then this difference is the effect of the program. How things changed compared to the counterfactual of them not receiving the program. We can define this a little bit more formally with the idea of a potential outcome. The potential outcome is what would be the outcome for an individual depending on whether they receive the program or not. And so the way this is indicated is by putting in brackets behind the outcome variable, either a one or a zero. So this Y1 here indicates that this is what the outcome for an individual would be if they were part of the program. Y0 in this case is what the outcome would be for an individual if they were not part of the program. 
Again, returning to our idea of the outcome as part of the program minus the counterfactual being the program effect, then in this notation, we would have this y open brackets one close brackets minus y open bracket zero close bracket. Given this notation and setting up this idea of counterfactuals, this is useful for illustrating the key problem that we face when trying to make causal statements. Ultimately, we cannot observe both potential outcomes at the same time. And this is the fundamental problem of causal inference. We can't observe potential outcomes. All we observe is the observed realized outcome from an individual depending on their program assignment. So for someone who is part of the program, we can see their potential outcome of being part of the program because they have taken part in this. This is realized but we are unable to know what their potential outcome from not taking part in the program. And vice versa. For those who don't take part in the program, who don't experience the policy, we observe their potential outcome for that condition, but we cannot observe their potential outcome for if they were to not to actually engage in the policy. It could be a different status. And so ultimately, this comparison is impossible because the counterfactual is missing. The idea of causal inference, and as we'll see with many of the comparisons we just generally make in terms of trying to figure out the effect of programs on policies, is that we need to compare. But in comparison, we are actually requiring and eliciting certain assumptions about the counterfactuals, about these potential outcomes that we cannot observe. Let's illustrate exactly what this looks like with a couple of problematic comparisons that we very often make uh, when evaluating policies or programs and why these can be potentially problematic. I'm gonna focus on two comparisons. The first comparison is comparing between enrolled and non-enrolled individuals or units. This can also be involving self-selection. What does this mean? The idea here would be to identify and assess the effect of the program or the policy as being, I compare those who participate in the program versus those who do not participate in the program seems a potentially valid way of assessing the difference. As we'll see, this requires some very strong assumptions and this can be quite problematic. To do so, let's think of a hypothetical program. I've created some data and I'm gonna show you where a bias can occur. So suppose we have a job training program where half of the individuals are enrolled in the program half of the individuals are not. And our outcome Y is whether they get employed afterwards. Now, what you can see from this is that for those who are part of the program, the top five individuals here, two out of the five are employed afterwards. For those who are not part of the program, three out of the five are actually employed afterwards. To simply put this in terms of a proportion, that the proportion employed for those who are not part of the program is higher than for those who are. Thus, from this simple comparison, we would think the program doesn't work. If anything, it makes things worse. As we'll see, the issue is for that statement to be true, we have to make some fairly strong assumptions about the potential outcomes we do not observe and about the counterfactuals. And in particular, I'll show you a fairly straightforward way that these counterfactuals can actually generate this effect, right? That the policy does have a, not have an effect, it has a negative effect, doesn't improve outcomes, even though it actually does. How is this the case? Well, what we're doing in my initial comparison, right? is we're comparing the average value for those in the program 
subtracting by the average value for those not in the program. So ultimately the proportions of individuals that get employed afterwards. And then this gives us my program effect estimate of negative 0.2. Why am I getting a negative effect? And why may this be a result of actually the program working, but it rather being an issue with the counterfactuals? Suppose this set of potential outcomes. Look at those who are part of the program. In the absence of the program, for those individuals, one of them would be employed. So we can already see that the program has some effect, right? If we were to a be able to observe the actual counterfactuals. That second respondent moved from a situation where they would not have been employed to a situation where they would have been employed. Again, suppose this other set of counterfactuals in terms of potential outcomes for those who did not receive the program. Ultimately, in this potential outcome, their likelihood, their enrollment in the program wouldn't have changed. It is identical between the two. What's one reason for this? Maybe people who know they're gonna be able to get a job anyway, don't need to engage in a job training program. But those who enroll in job training programs are those that need the extra skills to actually get a job in the future. So if we knew, these true potential outcomes as illustrated here, then we could simply compare the two. And what we would find is that actually our program has a small positive benefit driven by that second case where the person switched from not having a job to having a job. Why can this be the case? Why is it the case that if we were to know the true potential outcomes, the program actually would benefit everyone compared to what we observed with the data that I presented you originally. Ultimately, it's our comparison can be decomposed into two things. So this comparison between the difference in the outcomes for those part of the program versus those not part of the program can be decomposed into what we can call the average treatment effect on treated often use the acronym of ATT, and more crucially, this thing called the selection effect. What is the selection effect here? It's the difference in the potential outcomes of not receiving the program for those who are part of the program compared to those who are not. What would things have been like for those people if they hadn't been part of the program and whether this counterfactual differs between those who ultimately were enrolled and those who were not. What does this look like specifically with our case? As we noted before, we had this difference. Those in terms of being enrolled at the program, 40% of those were in, had employment afterwards compared to 60% of those who didn't take the program, giving us this negative treatment effect. If we look at the average treatment effect on the treated, right? Did the program have an effect if we knew the potential outcomes for those enrolled in the program? The second observation, we have a positive effect. Uh, and this constitutes again, to be an effect of 0.2. So then finally, what must be driving our negative outcome is a selection effect. And this is precisely what we see here. Those in the program were much less likely to have a job afterwards if they hadn't been enrolled in the program. Those not enrolled in the program were much more likely to have a job afterwards, even if they were not enrolled in the program. And so this selection effect ultimately biases our effect estimate for the effectiveness of the program, because those who did not receive the program were just much more likely to be unemployed in the first place. Those who were part of the program were just much more unemployable. And so that affects our estimate and makes us think that the program has negative effect, even though it truly has a positive effect. So this is the first problematic comparison we can make if we're not thinking seriously about causal inference. Simply comparing policies and groups 
and those enrolled in programs versus not can lead to biased estimates of the policies and of the programs if we don't think about these issues of selection and differences between the groups in the counterfactuals in the absence of the program. Now, one way of thinking to get around this is instead to think of before after comparisons or what are sometimes called pre post or reflexive comparisons. We can avoid the issue of people being different in their counterfactuals, being different in their potential outcomes, if we just track the same person over time, right? We then hold that constant if we instead look at someone before they received the program and then look at what their outcome was after receiving the program. While this may work, this also rests on pretty strong assumptions. In particular, it rests on the assumption that the counterfactuals would be stable over time. And the only thing that changed was receiving the program. So in this program example, what we're looking at is an example of microfinance and whether this increases rice yield. In year zero, before the microfinance program, the rice yield was 1,000. In year one, after the microfinance program, this increased to 1,100, point A on the figure. So the effect then in this pre-post comparison would be 1,100 minus 1,000, leading to an effect estimate of 100. Note that this implies a very strict counterfactual that in the absence of the program, the rice yield would be identical in the next year. Now, if for whatever reasons, there was a increase in weather that was more beneficial to growing rice that led to counterfactual C, this would not be accounted for. We would overestimate the effect of our program. Or if there was an adverse weather event that led to counterfactual D leading to a decline in rice yields, we would underestimate the effect of our program. Even though we can look within the same unit, the same individual over time with this pre and post calculation, we're still relying on key assumptions that things basically stay constant. And this, depending on the situation, may be very difficult and ultimately untenable. So these are the two key comparisons. Do we have solutions to this? Yes, and this is what we're getting into now. We're going to use some solutions and highlight approaches using observational data. There are, of course, other approaches that also deal with some of these issues that have other elements such as design-based inference, uh, experimental research, which allows you to directly manipulate differing and avoiding some of these issues. What we're going to focus on in this session, in this course today, is approaches that can be generally used for pretty much most data sets. Okay, this means they're going to potentially rely on stronger assumptions than design based approaches, but they're still going to increase the credibility of our results. What are these approaches we're going to use? We're going to first look at matching, which is going to involve constructing relevant comparison groups that increase the validity of our inferences. We're going to look at difference in differences, a way of combining different sources of variation that allow us to increase the credibility of our results. And then we're going to look at how we can combine the two of these together. All of this we're going to be doing using R. So let's start off with matching. What is the logic of matching and how does it work? The basic logic of matching comes from the stylized idea that ultimately what we want to do is compare people who are pretty much identical apart from whether they receive the treatment or not, whether they're part of the program. And so ideally, what you could do is have a broad set of characteristics of individuals, their age, their gender, their previous unemployment, whether they have a certain level of education or not. And then from these characteristics, just simply go to the treated and the untreated units and match people together who are identical in this regard. So I find in my treated unit, someone who's part of the program, 
a 41 year old who is coded as a male, who is 17 months unemployed and has a secondary diploma. Well, then I just look for the same type of person within my untreated unit. And then this is going to serve as a valid comparison, a valid counterfactual for the effect of the program. The key issue here, though, is one of dimensionality. Finding enough matches based off of discrete characteristics is incredibly difficult, particularly as you increase the number of characteristics you look at. It's a combinatorial nightmare. So one trick that matching in its practice uses is the idea of reducing the dimensionality of comparison and similarity. How do we do this? A very common approach is using the idea of a propensity score. The propensity score is where you construct a statistical model where you predict whether someone is part of the program or not based upon their observed characteristics. So in this case, I'm predicting whether someone's enrolled in the program or not, whether the head of the household is female and the education level of the head of the household. What this allows me to do is construct a single dimensional measure of similarity, the propensity score. What is your predicted probability of being in the treatment group given your observed characteristics? Once I've constructed this model and generated this predicted probability, then I'm gonna be able to match and compare units, households, individuals using this score. So that's what the logic of propensity score matching is gonna do. First, I would estimate that propensity score as shown there. Then I'm gonna check to see whether this propensity score matching is working well by first checking the distribution of the propensity score. Second, after matching with the propensity score, checking the balance to see that I've made two groups that look very similar on these observed characteristics. And then after that, I can estimate the effect of the program on the outcome. Why do I wanna check the distribution of the propensity score? The key thing here is that you want common support, sufficient overlap in terms of the types of people and the propensities to be in the program in your sample. In this particular case, what I'm showing is the propensity score by enrollment for this specific data set having obtained the propensity score from the model before. What this shows me is that generally, there's a pretty large overlap, there's significant common support of the propensity of being in part of the program for those who are actually part of the program versus those who are not. You run into difficulty if it's the case that there is not really much commonality between those who are enrolled and those who are not because then there's very few people to compare. To put in a kind of more stylized version with a hypothetical range of data, the key issue would be in this particular comparison of propensity scores, that for some of the non-enrolled, they have such a low, likely of being, low likelihood of being in the treatment condition, being enrolled in the program, that they are simply not comparable to those who are actually enrolled in the program. And this is this area outside of the common support for the left. Conversely, there are individuals who are enrolled in the program that are so likely to be in that program based on their propensity score that they are not comparable to those who are not enrolled in the program. This area outside of the common support to the right. Propensity score matching thus removes these individuals as they're likely to not be relevant. So having done this, having matched people together, then what we can do is check the balance. And the way we're gonna check the balance is simply using a summary command on this object. What I'm showing you here is first, what the balance or the similarity across enrolled versus non-enrolled based on these characteristics are before we conducted the matching. What we see here is that in our non-enrolled group, the control group, there was a much larger proportion of female head of households. So approximately 11% compared to 7% in the treatment group. In terms of education, there are some slight differences as well. 
what we want to do with matching then is to make these households similar, right? Because we could think that the effect of a program would be different and be biased by failing to account for the sex of the head of the household and the level of education. If we look at what this balance looks like after matching, then what we see is that we have pretty much identical means and as close as we can get to this really um, in our matched sample, okay? So matching has now decreased the difference between these two groups. Ultimately, once we've done this, then we just simply have to estimate the effect of the program. How do we do this? We extract the matched data from our matching object. This is what this match.data function does. Then we run a regression, in this case with robust standard errors, using this as the data object. And so our outcome here is gonna be the health expenditures for a household in time one, as a function of whether they're enrolled or not. Using this match data, this allows us to then make a better comparison. And then we add in the weights for those circumstances where there is differential weighting in the units, where you have more than one unit matched to another unit. And then from this, we can simply look and interpret the effect of the program. And what we find is that enrollment in the program decreased health expenditures quite considerably, like $10 um, with a confidence interval around 9.5 to 11. One caveat, recent research actually says propensity score matching is not that good for certain circumstances and may ultimately be creating more imbalance. And so it may be better to use a different matching approach in order to actually match your sample and then estimate your models. Thankfully, this is relatively simple. This was the code for propensity score matching. The key thing that tells it that it's propensity score matching is this final line, which says distance equals GLM, link equals probit. This is the propensity score model. If we just replace this with distance Mahalanobis, a different form of metric for measuring similarity, then we avoid the issues with the propensity score and use a matching algorithm that actually is better in certain circumstances. There are many options to explore though within this match it function. And there is much guidance in terms of which types of matching approach to use uh, that is beyond the scope of this current course. So that's matching. That's really about trying to make similarities um, the key focus ensure similarities in the counterfactuals and about the characteristics of individuals when looking across groups, right? So doing these um, comparisons of enrollment versus non-enrollment. A different approach is to use difference and differences. And this is gonna be important as it allows us to take into account more variation. Recall, we talked about these two problematic comparisons, enrolled versus non-enrolled, the self-selected comparisons. Matching is going to help us to some extent with that. But we also had this other comparison, right? The before and after pre-post reflexive comparison. What difference in differences is going to do is going to take some of the features of each of these comparisons, combine them together to ultimately generate a more credible inference. And this is really an excellent feature of the difference and differences approach. Of course, this relies on you having both data over time and across different units. So how is this working? The before after comparison, what this allows you to do is difference out all those time invariant differences between groups, units, and individuals, right? So if someone's employability is constant over time, then a before after comparison will difference this away. This combined with having a control group, having a group you can compare to, you can use the trajectory in this control group as the counterfactual for what would have happened to the treatment group absent the program. You no longer have to assume a constant trajectory of their outcome, this flat, 
constant outcome that we observed when looking at the before after comparison. Using a control group, we can look to see how their outcomes would have changed. And that serves as an estimate of the counterfactual for the treatment group. Let's put this more specifically. We observed two groups and they're observed over time. The black group is the treatment group. The gray group is the control group. And we're comparing that outcome in terms of employment. At some point, there is a treatment. This treatment occurs between year zero and year one. So what we can do is look at how things change over time. And so the key idea being here is that this increase in the outcome for the treatment group from A to B, this is the before after comparison, right? An increase of roughly 0.14. This has the potential problem of bias because for that to be the appropriate causal effect of the program, we have to assume that the employment rate would have stayed constant over time for that group. But now we have a comparison group. And so we can see what happened to them over that same time period since the treatment group received the treatment, received the program. And what we see is that for those who didn't receive the program at all, their employment rate also increased by 0.03 in this time period, 3%. So what does that tell us? It tells us that employment was generally increasing. And so our treatment effect, just looking at the treatment group, would be overestimating the effect of the program because the impact of the program is added to by the general increase in unemployment, uh, in employment over this time. But as we have this information, we can simply difference this out. What does this mean? We see what the change is for our treatment group of 0.14. We say that it would have also increased by 0.03 based off of what happened in the control group. So we subtract that off and that gives us our estimated impact of 0.11. So employment increased, but not as much as if we did this before after comparison. How do we do this statistically in R? We can just run again, a regression where we have an interaction effect. We have two indicators, whether you're part of the treatment group or not, and the time period, whether it's before or after the treatment. Each of those are coded zero and one. Zero, if you're in the control group, didn't receive the program. One, if you're in the treatment group, did receive the program. Zero, if it's before the treatment was assigned and implemented, before the program was assigned and implemented, one, if it's after the program was assigned and implemented. And then we have an interaction of these two. We multiply these two variables together. And this R code allows you to do this. It turns out that our difference in differences estimate is going to be the coefficient on that interaction term. So for this additional example, where we look at treatments um, affecting health expenditures for localities, we see that the treatment in this program led to a decrease in health expenditures by approximately $6. But how do we interpret all of these things? And what is the meaning of the round variable or coefficient here, or the treatment coefficient here? To understand this, let me do a simple graph. So what this graph shows you is the outcome over time for both the control and the treatment condition the control being white here, the treatment condition being purple. Our intercept term, our constant in the regression, tells us the expected value of the outcome for the control group before the treatment was allocated and implemented, before the program started. Beta one, the coefficient on the treatment variable. This tells us the difference in the outcome between the treatment and the control group those enrolled in the program, those not enrolled in the program before the treatment was implemented. Beta two, the coefficient on the period or the time period variable. Well, that tells us 
how much the outcome changed for those in the control group comparing post to pre-treatment implementation. So how did the outcome change when the treatment was implemented in general for those in the control group? So again, this is this measure of the counterfactual change, the change that would have occurred regardless of the treatment existed. And then finally, beta three shows you the difference between the actual observed outcome for the treatment group once it received the treatment, once it received the program, compared to this counterfactual outcome, which is generated from the slope of beta two, combined with the pre-treatment value of the treatment group in their program. Ultimately showing you how much things changed in the treatment group, and then differencing off what the change would have been regardless if it had not have received the treatment based upon what we have see, observed in the control group. In this regard, it's very important to note that there is a key assumption here that allows us to do all this comparison. And this key assumption is that of parallel trends. So the reason we're able to make this comparison is that we are assuming that if there was no program, the treatment group would behave in expectation identically to the control group. Those who got the program would behave identically over time to those not. Not in terms of their actual outcomes, but in terms of how their outcomes change, right? So there may be initial differences between the program and non-program participants. But we're assuming that they behave identically in terms of increasing, staying the same, or decreasing over time. This is a key assumption. It cannot be proven. But we can try and examine things to potentially increase the credibility of this. To put more concretely, why does this matter? The issue is, is that our true counterfactual, if it differs from the comparison group trend, then this is gonna bias the treatment effect estimate. Okay, much in the same way that our assumption of a counterfactual in a before after comparison of being just completely flat, no change, biases our treatment effect estimate. Getting the wrong trend will also bias treatment effect estimate. So in this regard, what it turns out is that in our hypothetical data, the treatment group's true counterfactual was actually leading to an even steeper increase in the employment over this time. And so as a result, by using a counterfactual that has a lower rate of change of employment, which is that of the control groups, we overestimate the effect of the program. Employment would have increased at an even higher rate in the employment group than the control group absent the program. And so this difference that we attribute is going to be less. How can we increase our confidence given these issues? So one, if we have sufficient data, we can compare the two groups beforehand, right? If we have a long sequence of data observations of the treatment in the comparison group, right, those enrolled in the program versus those not, that we can observe over time before the program gets implemented, and these look like they're pretty much moving in tandem all this time, then we can be more confident in terms of this assumption being valid. We can also look at adding in some different approaches to assess how sensitive our results are by using placebo tests and using alternative outcomes. With these approaches, we wanna make sure that we're just not picking up noise, right? So if we use fake treatment groups, outcomes that should not be affected by our program, and we still see significant effects, that should cause us to be a bit more cautious about interpreting this causally. If, however, we come up with these fake treatment groups, if we look at outcomes where our program shouldn't have an effect, and we don't find anything significant, then we can increase our confidence about the effectiveness 
of the program and the validity of our causal estimate. We can put a checklist on this in terms of if you were to conduct a difference and differences approach. So think seriously about would the outcomes have moved in tandem over time when comparing the treatment and comparison group in the absence of the program? Would things look similar or would we have good, strong theoretical reasons of why they would differ? Because this is crucial for the parallel trends assumption. Try and conduct different analyses using different plausible comparison groups. Assess how sensitive your results are. Again, look at fake or outcomes that should not be affected by the comparison you're looking at, right? And if you find non-significant effects there, then you can increase your confidence again. If you find significant effects though, then you have to be worried that something is going on with the unobservables. And then if you're able to do so with even more data, look at conducting analyses with your chosen outcome group with two groups that are distinct from one another but would not affect it by the program. Again, if you see any differences then emerging, this should cause you to question a bit what the assumptions um, are doing in terms of are they actually being violated? Are there just differences where that are occurring that we can't observe and ultimately decrease the credibility of our estimated effect. So while these are two distinct approaches, difference and differences and matching, what we can also do is combine the two together to try and increase the leverage of their strengths for tackling this inference problem with regards to causality when thinking about the effect of policies and programs. So how are we gonna bolster our difference in differences approach by using matching? Well, if we match on pre-treatment characteristics, we can think of this as increasing the plausibility that the parallel trend would not be violated, right? Units that are similar before the pre-treatment phase are probably gonna behave similar as well afterwards, even if they don't receive the program or not, right? In this counterfactual sense. So we can use matching to potentially increase the validity of our difference in differences estimator by increasing the potential validity of those units being similar in how they would change over time. How do we do so? Well, simply we're just gonna use our matching algorithm again on the pre-treatment characteristics. So the characteristics of the units before the program gets implemented. In this case, we're looking at households, so we have a wide array of characteristics that we can match on. Again, this is why using something that reduces this to a smaller dimensional measure is gonna be incredibly important. If we were to try and exactly match units by these various combinations of characteristics, it's an, an arduous, impossible task due to the curse of dimensionality. And what we'll do is we'll use this Mahalanobis distance given the criticisms of propensity score matching. So we're matching in all these various characteristics. We then extract our matched data frame, okay? What this does is it gives us the observations that are matched, right? So matching those who are part of the program versus not, and then using the household identifiers from there and the weights that are obtained, we then rejoin into our original data frame, these things, right? So this then allows us to filter out those units that were not matched and ensures that we add in the weights. The key thing being here that our original data frame has all time periods, whereas the data frame we're conducting the matching on has one time period, that time period before we had the program. And so what we're doing then in the second line of code is matching this in to ensure that all of the units over time are indicated whether they're matched or not and what the weight of this match should be. Again, once we've done this data processing, then it's relatively straightforward for us to estimate the effect of the program. We run our difference in differences model, right? So our outcome here is health expenditures over time. 
we have our indicator of what whether the unit is part of a treatment group or not, whether it gets the program or not. And we have an indicator of what time period it is, this time, the round. We tell it, use our data frame that is from the matched data. We supply the weights that are generated from the matching that tell us how important certain units are in terms of whether they're matched to more units than others. And then we add in some robust standard errors clustered by the locality of the units. And then having done so, we get our regression results. Our difference in differences estimate is that of the interaction term, so that bottom coefficient there. And what we see is that the treatment led to a decrease in health expenditures of approximately $6 in the time period study with a confidence interval of around minus five to minus seven. So a statistically significant decrease in health expenditures caused by the program. So in conclusion, what have we learned today and what things have we covered? We've covered the issue that when we're faced with making comparisons, using observational data, trying to assess the effectiveness of a program, of a policy, we face significant challenges to inference. Comparing those who are enrolled versus not enrolled has certain potential problematic comparisons. Comparing units before and after they receive programs, again, has problematic components in terms of the counterfactuals and comparisons we're making. And so we need to be very cognizant of these challenges and these limitations when we want to conduct a program evaluation, when we want to identify the effect of a policy on an outcome of interest. This is ever more important because it's not always going to be possible for us to be able to randomize these things. Ideally, we would be able to run experiments, randomized controlled trials, where we randomize whether individuals have access to the program where we randomize whether a policy is implemented or not. But very often this is practically infeasible, whether for ethical reasons or for logistical reasons. And so we want to still be able to try and make some inference using the observational data that we can generate, looking at those enrolled versus not, and looking at those enrolled over time versus not. And so the approaches we've covered here, such as matching and difference in differences, can help increase the credibility of these results and allow us to more confidently assert the causal effect and the impact of programs upon outcomes that we are interested in. Okay, that's it for the course today. I hope this is an interesting introduction to learning how observational data can be used to make causal statements to really assess how effective programs are and whether policies do matter for outcomes, and to be a bit more cautious when interpreting and reading other studies that make these before, after, or enrolled versus non-enrolled comparisons. All of the code available for the tasks here are going to be on the website that's linked within the video. I hope you found this an interesting introduction to the idea of causality in program and policy evaluation and how we could use data to do this. There is a world of other approaches that build on this and look at this in different ways. And so I hope you have fun exploring them as well.